and welcome to the very first meeting of our special Living One series, Conversations in Community with Nature. My name is Olivia Crossman. I'm your host. Conversations in Community with Nature brings together two communities committed to respectful and articulate relationship with all of nature's beings to meet in conversation and counsel. Having each in their own way worked in the interstitial space with animals, Dina Metzger and Gabe Bradshaw initiate exploration and exchange with others to listen deeply and move human awareness to nature's consciousness. Dina Metzger is a writer, healer, and teacher whose work spans multiple genres, including the novel, poetry, nonfiction, and plays. She is the author of many books, including the novels, A Reign of Nightbirds, concerning two climatologists, La Negra y Blanca, Feral, and The Other Hand. Her other books include The Burden of Light, Ruin, and Beauty, and Entering the Ghost River, Meditations on the Theory and Practice of Healing. Dina co-edited Intimate Nature, The Bond Between Women and Animals, which pioneered the radical understanding that humans are highly intelligent, that animals are highly intelligent, excuse me, and exhibit intent. Her experiences with elephants in the wild over 20 years is based on their spiritual agency and complex narrative communication. Some of that experience is chronicled in her novel, La Vieja, A Journal of Fire. She has developed the literature of restoration to, among other goals, advanced earth-based writing, restore climate, and counter extinction. Gabe Bradshaw is the founder of our Krulo Center for Nonviolence and the Tortoise and Hare Sanctuary. She is the author of Elephants on the Edge, What Animals Teach Us About Humanity, Carnivore, Mi Carnivore Minds, Who These Fearsome Animals Really Are, Talking with Bears, Conversations with Charlie Russell, and co-author of the novel, The Evolved Nest, Nature's Way of Raising Children and Creating Communities, a primary carer of the sanctuary resident facility. About halfway through our time together today, we will be opening up this discussion for anyone to share their comments, questions, dreams, and experiences. Please feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to share, and I'll be sure to facilitate that. Also, please do note that the Zoom session will be recorded, so if you would feel more comfortable leaving your camera off or changing your Zoom name, please feel free to do so. Finally, we ask that unless you are currently speaking, you keep your microphone muted to avoid any unintended interruptions. So without further ado, I think Gay is going to start us off with a poem. Hello, everyone. Hi, Dina. Lovely to be together. Yeah, this is a poem that both that really resonated for both Dina and I. And I'm going to start off um, with this poem and Dina is going to follow with one of her own. The poem is called Behaving Like a Jew by Gerald Stern. When I got there, the dead opossum looked like an enormous baby sleeping on the road. It took me only a few seconds just seeing him there with the hole in his back and the wind blowing through his hair to get back again into my own animal sorrow. I am sick of the country, the blood-stained bumpers, the stiff hairs sticking out of the grills, the slimy highways, the heavy birds refusing to move. I am sick of the spirit of Lindbergh over everything, that joy in death, that philosophical understanding of carnage, that concentration on the species. I am going to be unappeased at the opossum's death. I'm going to behave like a Jew and touch his face and stare into his eyes and pull him off the road. I am not going to stand in a wet ditch with the Toyotas and Chevys passing over me at 60 miles an hour and praise the beauty and balance and lose myself in the immortal life stream when my hands are still a little shaky from his stiffness and his bulk and my eyes are still weak and misty from his round belly and his curved fingers and his black whiskers and his little dancing feet. The um, animal sorrow, right? So when, uh, when Gay uh, read this poem to me, um, I remember this poem that I had written called Dreaming the Road. It wasn't a dream, unless we shared it open-eyed, 
your car exploding into dream car, driving us further than we understood, dreaming the road. We might dream only the first red stroke on a preliminary map, dream the cartographer, the engineer, and the man at the curve of the road with the sign, stop, it wasn't a dream. It wasn't the afternoon road, the trees light speckled, it was bark and leaf, it was moon stopped us, or wind, and a mud-stained pine root rose ghostly across our way, stopped us in a dream. We stopped on the divided road and waited to build the road. I see, you see, the squirrel dragging her dead mate across the road. There's the poem. We did not dream this. And we do not plunge into sorrow. Friendship is not prepared for what we see. We shift in the car from each other. This is a vision for lovers. This small creature hobbled by her burden, teeth in the tail and claws too small to carry, insists her way across the road. The two of them, the live one and the dead one make their way to some leaf mulched grave. We stop and wait. Then she, he, you say, skitters away, frightened by the shadows we cast, and we become pallbearers with twigs. Do we dare you ask? And lay him, her, you say, under a tree. And then drive on. Might have been a car that didn't stop, we say. What can friendship manage? Lovers might live the dream and build a temple at the sight of God in the afternoon, dragging the lover back to the dark heart. But we did not dream this. The road was a road. We had to be cautious of our scent. Soon the ants would come. I know this story and the irrevocable order of things. I think the reason that both of these poems came to us is that we must know that th these deaths are the equivalent of human deaths and that we are being called um, in this time to recognize a certain parity with the natural world. Is that where it takes you, Gay? Or I, I guess I wouldn't say the word parody. Um, to me, it's your beautiful, beautiful poem. Uh, to me, it's, it's a letting go of, of the human ego you know, it, it's a letting go of any grounding in that space and a, a dissolution into nature, what we call anyone else but us. <laughs> right. So, you, you know, to me, that's the really letting go of that's calling. So parody for me, you know, although I understand that, word. right. <laughs> Is that it's it's really a letting go, and and I think that that's, you know, and and what you're saying is, you know, not walking on, not moving on, not, you know, and, and this even goes for humans, you know, to understand the sanctity of the rhythm of life, and certainly in this case as well as Gerald Stern's, um, both are violations of the rhythm of life. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Uh, since you uh, gave me the poem, the, the, the Gerald Stern poem, I've read it many times. And of course, I know my own poem. But remembering that moment of the squirrel, recognizing that her lover had been killed by a car, 
and offering him with all her strength, this tiny little body pushing, pulling this other body across the road, offering him a proper death, brings tears to my eyes again. I'm completely undone by the two of them. Must be 20 years ago that this, that this happened. And You know, I'd like to read another poem. It, yes. It, um, yeah. Because it's another story, really. Um, I've lived with wolves since my son brought a wolf home in uh, 1977. So that's a really, that's a really long time. When you live with wolves, you live with the most profound companion and such a, an amazing intelligence. So this is about the death of Timberwolf, who was the second wolf that Greg brought home probably 1978, the death of the wolf. I begin to dig the grave, the joy of the pickaxe against the stone, that splintering that only comes when metal strikes and what seems so solid is sheared. She, and I need to say it now, um, she was Isis, and Isis was a white wolf that Pami Ozaki brought here. And Timber was an old man when Isis came. So she's about a year here. And she was incredibly in love with him. She slept behind him slept beside him all night, her vigil now, as he had slept beside her, turning her to breathe. Those times when she was passing over to this side with equal struggle, crossing here from death. You know what? This is not about Isis. This, is, this paragraph is about Pammy. <laughs> and we'll see Isis in, in, a, in a moment. So. Isis fell in love with Timberwolf, but Timberwolf was taking care of Pammy. She slept beside him all night, her vigil now, as he had slept beside her, turning her to breathe. Those times when she was passing over to this side with equal struggle, crossing here from death, he found her as she found him under the tree among the leaves, their brokenness mended each other, the two serrated halves fit. To glue one part to another, you must roughen the surface first. That which is smooth or perfect cannot fit against another. You bring the rain. Your dying breaks the clouds. The language of the sky drums upon the leaves and yellow blossoms of the acacia. There is a grief which has no earthly counterpart, though they say here this place Earth is the only place death exists. That means there is no life anywhere else. This means this place, this earth, is death's house. You are hovering about me. I can feel you in my nostrils everywhere. Every time I breathe, the howl, both mournful and ecstatic, echoes the death of the wolf, but not the death of the spirit was something like a star going out or being born. That electric shudder, your entire body trembling, the current rushing also through my heart, your spirit shaking off the flesh. I cannot believe it is the end of love. You always tended us so well. Spirit is gone, I said, but he's still alive. And then moments later, he's dead. 
In the afternoon, we knew a star had appeared somewhere in the universe. The great darkness punctured by a new light. I expect nothing less than such a flame from you, a sun that will burn 10 billion years until we're all aflame or all put out. A great beauty descended upon you in your death, the grace of your entire life coalescing into a moment of perfect sleep. I passed my hand over your yellow eyes that had become stones. In the morning, you moved your belly rising with the first motion of the universe, the gases within you burning. The other wolf stood at the edge and pushed dirt onto you with her nose. Now you are shaking the branches of the olive tree that will root about your bones. Your body in the earth on the knoll where we are permitted to bury only my ashes. When I die, they will say, she gave the wild a home, a wolf lived with her. The olive leaf is dark on one side and full of light on the other. What's the true right relationship with the beings of the natural world. And this time, and will we survive as, as a species, which is the question I'm always asking, if we do not allow ourselves to enter the natural world in an appropriate way. And I think what you're saying, Gay, is we have to undo ourselves in order to be able to do that. You know, when I hear these amazing, beautiful poems, Dina, you know, it's my question. I have another question is why do we listen? You know, why are we spending that time? And I don't think it's to, to bathe ourselves in sorrow or mourning or any of things like that. It's to not skate on the world anymore, to stop skating. And as I said, letting go, you know, letting the ice break and enter into this fuller world. So it's not to be maudlin or to grieve and to valorize non-humans in a way as a way of recompense for the neglect and then go back to life as usual. It is that dissolution of this shell that we've been entombed in. I don't think it's a valorization. It is a recognition of, um, of the nature of nature. What I meant by valorization is too often there's it, it, you know, I think it's something like often happens perhaps, you know, in a funeral, human funeral, where, you know, everyone is speaking nice words about the person and, you know, going through these motions and they're going through motions and then life resumes. So what I meant by valorization was in the sense of, you know, sticking it into some kind of uh, resin <laughs> and stashing it away. Um, and, but that's not the being. That's not the way, the way you read and the way you described. It's really a calling. Calling of respect is becoming in that world. That's my thought. Yeah. So Timberwolf died, I don't know, let's say 1997, somewhere or before that. So it's 25 plus years. And... He's a presence because he always was a presence. An extraordinary presence. And most recently, 
we lost a very beloved wolf, Chinook, who right now is, 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 is a presence. Um, I guess I'm concerned about the um, the diminishment of the non-human by the um, valorization of the human. And uh, I am interested in what what are these other beings and how how might we know them? I'm interested in your relationship with Tommy, if you'll speak about it, because I had the uh, the honor and the pleasure of uh, reading the piece last night that you've that you've started. Um, I don't know if you want to speak about Tommy. Well, I'm happy to, but I'd like to ask you through Timberwolf and others and Chinook, um, how have you changed? I mean, you speak of their presence, but there's also a change in you over these arc of meetings and passings. When I realized that Timberwolf was truly my companion and that there was um, that we were like, that we, not we were like, we were two beings living together in complex relationship and communication. And, and the same with Chinook, who is not not my primary companion, but Cheryl's primary companion, and she is here and she may wish to speak of Chinook or not. Um, but I had the enormous privilege of having, um, because, just because of physical space and health and all kinds of things, that Chinook was um, living with me and gentle boy at the end of her life, the last few months. And to be with her in, in who she was. I don't know if it diminishes the human because I gained so much from it, but Maybe I can say this, and maybe this is the ch this is the change that comes. You know, as you know, I'm really concerned, beyond concerned, with the fate of the Earth and how Earth will be, can be, might be restored from all the criminal procedures of the of the human. And after all these years, the only understanding that I have of the possibility of restoration is if we immerse ourselves in the ways and the intelligence of the natural world and yield to that way of knowing. And uh, I'm also changed because I watched Cheryl um, should we say surf Chinook, <laughs> right? Sure. <laughs> that we learn how to be people by serving and trying to intuit, trying to learn the language, you know, I, I think everybody here is probably connected with animals in some way or another. You know, they learn our languages far better than we learn theirs. There's no question about it. It's a great, subtle, daily activity to say, now, 
what are you saying? Can I possibly understand that? You know, um, so that's how I'm changed. I, I didn't know that when, when I was a child. I knew that animals were fabulous. And I knew just the circumstances of my life that, um, that we were destroying the world because I understood at nine the bomb and that human mind that would create something like that, which animals would not. But at this age, when I go for wisdom, I go to the animal world. That would be my answer to your question. You know, Cheryl, do you want to say anything about Chinook? Thank you, Dina. Um, well, I can speak about how I changed, if that's okay. Um, when Chinook was a puppy, um, she she entered my heart, and um, I knew my life would change, and I wasn't sure if I was up to it. And uh, she guided me through so much, and I learned from her the body language and the looks of the language that she carried. And we were companions. And my life was never the same afterwards. Um, you wake up in the morning, life was around Chinook. And uh, my work was around Chinook. And very rarely were we separated unless I had to do a trip. And the magic of her is always knowing when I was coming home. <laughs> but the one story I would love to share is the one time um, now Chinook and Chinook's sister Chawaya and her mom Cherokee lived on the land here and they ran around. And they would go for a run, oh, probably about six in the morning and come home at nine. And uh, I went to feed them one morning and they were just not around. And I'm looking around and trying to figure out where they might be. And well, I'm coming up the hill. And I live here on the land with Dina, as you probably understand by the conversation. Um, and so I'm walking up the hill and I see Chawaya coming or I mean Cherokee and Cherokee is coming down and she has this long, long bone. And I'm like, oh my God, where did she find that? And then Chawaya, her other daughter comes down the hill and she has a smaller bone. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And Chawaya comes off to the side and they're all happy because you know they found something. And then Chinook's coming up behind them. And she is carrying a Birkenstock. I don't know where they found these things, but I thought, my God, they must have found somebody. You know, I mean, a Birkenstock and two long bones. I'm thinking that's a leg, you know. <laughs> and I'm cracking up because the joy in them and what they found. And, you know, as a human, my first thought is the worst thing in the world. And as them being who they are, the joy of what they found. And it was always something. There was always something you had to adjust to with the three of them. You know, Cherokee got bit by a snake and the other two didn't know that she did. They didn't see it. But I'll tell you, their response to poses or anything that looked like a snake afterwards was incredible. They jumped six feet up into the air, never responded like that to anything. So there's a communication 
that even if they don't see each other, that they have that we don't. And the body languages. I mean, yeah, we look at body languages in humans, but we don't look at the body language in other beings. They say so much. They say so much in their mind. They say so much in their heart. They say so much in their bodies. And we move so fast that we don't pay attention to it. And to be immersed, like Dina says, within, I had 14 years with Chinook and she taught me so much and it was an immersion into her wildness. There was no taking away as much of her wildness that I, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. And I respected it. So thank you. Thank you, Dina, for asking. Yeah. Thank you, Cheryl. It's wonderful. These were the days, of course, when we could live uh, and let and let them run free. And I'm watching the um, the gentrification and the fear, enormous fear growing in in people about the wild, um, and the desire to keep animals in exactly the kind of conditions that they would never, ever, ever choose. Um, because we can't, we can't let a wolf run free, we can't let a dog run free. It's insane. And we can't run free. That's that's the consequences are um, a failure to be able to live a true nature. I've just gotten this look from Gentle Boy. <laughs> Um, you wanted me to talk about Tommy. Why don't you ask me something? <laughs> Get into more of a wordless zone. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what's happening to uh, to uh, both of us. Um, well. I received this manuscript from uh, from you today about a relationship that you it's probably emblematic of the relationships that you have with the animals of for whom you provide sanctuary and your incredible devotion to these beings. Um, and I know you didn't learn this way from, um, from Charlie Russell, but I think there's also something here about having had that long relationship with Charlie Russell and his long relationship with bears. And so you have been immersed, um, uh, in the reality and the complexity and the beauty and the silence and the communication of another intelligence. So here is Tommy and, um, and you understand something about Tommy's nature that is not easily understood by people and you feel altered by her. So, will you tell us about that connection? Well, you know, I've been, as you know, I've been thinking about this a lot. And uh, at, at one level, which I, I don't think I sent you the quote unquote second chapter as such. I'm just writing something. I'm even not sure that it's going to see the light of day other than your dad. It's going to see the light of day. <laughs> um, but um, the <clears throat> the following chapter, I, I, I introduced what Dina talks about is something I wrote um, 
I just started writing and it was about Tommy. Tommy was a uh, big, big boned as, as I talk about her. She's big white rabbit, big boned. And she came uh, quote unquote rescued with eight others. Oh, I don't know, seven something years ago or whatever. And they had been living in tiny cages um, outside and a bit, they'd been abandoned when a, the homeowner sold the house. He just left them there. And so the new homeowner discovered them 10 days later and then called. And um, so we took them and they had been without food or water for almost 10 days. <clears throat> and uh, Tommy was older than the rest, um, very stolid, kind of quiet person. And um, I'm just kind of giving you the arc a little bit of that. And and so that was when we became the tortoise in the hare sanctuary, which is now Grace Village. Um, and, oh, I don't know how many years it was it was. At one point, which is not uncommon with older rabbits, they get arthritis in their rear legs. Anyway, she was unable to walk and she just kind of, in a sense, almost one day just went, that's it. <laughs> so she moved in with me in the studio um, and I began to take care of her in detail, you know, doing things that she was not able to do for herself. And I slept on the floor next to her um, and it was a big sort of, you know, magic discovery like oh I could sleep on the bed with her <laughs> so that's what we did it was kind of a big step <clears throat> but anyways she had a series of um as she aged she had a series of different kinds of ailments um and um on on several occasions developed but um domestic rabbits seem to get it's not unknown it's probably because what they of genetic engineering but they can't naturally vomit so if something gets caught in their throat, it it makes them vulnerable to choking. And so she had several of those occasions and um, uh, they were very frightening. And then at one point, you know, her, her she sort of spiraled down, um, and, you know, no, and it was it got to the point where my care for her became very intrusive. We spent 20 hours a day, you know, Cheryl, what you were saying. I mean, Tommy and I spent 20 hours a day and she would lie next to me while I wrote Um and um, and so she just, you know, it was kind of like she got these different, you know, GI things and choke, you know, and it, it became really intrusive. So, you know, in the care for her and, and how I feel sort of philosophically for anyone is to be there almost like a prosthetic, you know, kind of a, a care prosthetic. So being there, manipulating the quote unquote environment so that they're able to make the choices on their own of, of how to live and, and all. So she really became quite listless and spiritless and um, she was apparently transitioning. And so I, I gave her a pain med um, injected that the doctor had given me to, to help ease. It, it doesn't accelerate the passing. It just is an easing thing. And uh, <clears throat> she um, died, you know, and I was with her and I was, hope, you know, I was next to her and it was very, very disturbing. Um, and I used a stethoscope and she wasn't breathing. Um, and so I gathered herbs and laid them around her rosemary and lavender. And she loved wild blueberries. And I, I put a circle around her and lit some incense. And I don't know how long it was. It was probably a few minutes. And um, I was at my head next to her and I was weeping and trying to say the right things about, you know, you're safe, you know, you're entering the arms of all my family and, and, you know, you're safe and, you know, we'll always be together and things. And, you know, my head was down and I was weeping and um, I felt some motion and, you know, I kind of brushed my face and, and um, she was recovering. So she essentially started eating her blueberries <laughs> uh, and I was in shock. I mean, it was just, it was sort of like, I, I literally kind of pinched myself and shook my head. Uh, she came back to life and it, it was several minutes. And um, the whole process of, and she lived for, I don't know, maybe a year more. I don't know what it was. And um, I was completely and I can maybe Dina you can help me find some better words but it just really felt like the sky parted literally physically I I looked up and and the sky 
the, the every it parted. I mean, no one jumped out, but there was this a physical experience of the world parting the sky. I call it the sky because it was quote unquote empty. And that was a significant shift in me. Um, something very deep dissolved. You'll hear me use the word dissolve. I, I look at it like we live in these, or at least my experiences. And over time, you know, even with the incidents with Tommy's almost near dying choking, uh, it, every time with her and and with others, um, one one was with Vine Deloria way back. Um, he was a Sioux scholar, and um, there was another veil that dissolved. You know, to me, I see these as in my experience, these are veils of conditioning that have been passed on year after year. These ten thousand plus years of our species, the the dominant strain of our species entering this unreal um, anthropocentric insulated world of separation and superiority over the rest of nature. So my experience in life has been these these series of dissolutions. And um, the, the experience with Vine, which I've shared with others, but um, I had read his book. This is years ago. I read his book as a teenager. And then later when I was a scientist, I came across God is Red again. And I was like astounded. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to translate this into environmental policy. <laughs> you know, crazy. At one point, you know, we started corresponding and I met him and we were talking and uh, he started talking about, you know, he's Lakota Sioux talking about these giant buffalo coming from the sky and so I had this internal dialogue that was going on which was milliseconds but there was this one part of me that said buffaloes from the sun well that's ridiculous well he must he must think it's a metaphor no he's not talking about his metaphor so there's this dialogue of saying you know he's speaking metaphorically he's speaking whatever and the other one says no you know and I just don't believe you know da 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 and then I said you know if you love him and admire him you just hear him. And that was when a veil dissolved inside me. I, and I really felt this veil. So I bring that up also because of, of the term love. And to me, love is um, veilless. <laughs> it's a state of being veilless. And I believe that all of nature lives veilless unless um, they have acquired these shells or veils because of their experience with this dominating human. So when I speak about human, I'm talking about this dominating culture. So with Tommy and what I sent Dina, I also talked about how our relationship unfolded before her um, near death experience. And I spoke to, um, well, on email, <laughs> Kim Van Lama, who wrote in a beautiful book. He, he was a cardiologist and he wrote a whole treatise on, on near death experiences um, that he had with the doctor and actually, you know, researched it from the space. And he talks about that and near death experiencers talk about this love. And so that's really how I see the substrate that there is no connection as such. I don't have a connection with the animals. I just am not, I'm less bound, um, from being in this substrate of love. And so our time together, you know, she was with me. And as Dina talks about, and, and Cheryl, I think you said that too, is that um, the word, there's constant communication. I hear constant communication wherever I am, um, whether the animals are near or far or the trees or whatever. Um, and, and I don't see it as any particular skill or a gift. I think there's much more gifted people, but I think that I've become increasing, like I said, more, connected and less separated by the veils and shells. And so there's this constant traffic of, of things going on, which aren't necessarily spoken. And I think this also relates to Dina, your project, we'll call it that, of the literature of restoration. And how I understand that, and I also hear your poetry, is we've become so reliant on words instead of using them as keys or as portals for, again, I'll use that dissolution of the veils and bringing us into this one world 
we use them as substitutes. And I guess that refers to a little bit of valorization. So the power of your poetry, for example, the power of Gerald Stern's poem is, uh, it reminds us, I think, of who we actually are and, and asks us to let go and, and have the courage to live in the love substrate, which really, I think that's the main reason that holds people back is fear of letting go and being vulnerable. And so that's my experience too, is that when Tommy, Tommy did have a, a shift um, and that shift was she really trusted me. Um, be, be, when I first met her to quote unquote, when she had passed is I saw her relax more, becoming more open to me. And that was because she did not have to have any guard. And so she came into herself completely um, in, in my experience. And that's the way we were in each other's presence and when we weren't. I think what's so important here is that you had a true relationship, true, complex, detailed, responsive, interconnected relationship across species, between two beings who suddenly were quite different, as you say in the book, you just happen to have different forms, but we're really communicating. And I think what both of us are trying to do is to open as many pathways as we know how, so that more and more and more of us can enter, return to that relationship with the reality of 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 the world and um I, for me western culture is a horrible limitation on reality and so the sky opening or the dissolve, however you put it, I think we all have different experiences of what that is. But how do we step out of the limitations that Western culture imposes and begin to live in, not only speak of the exotic experiences or so-called exotic experiences when we have these connections, but how do we live there? And whether it's the literature of re restoration, creating a literature that does not reify consistently Western values and assumptions, um, because that's taking us to extinction. It's very clear that's, that's where those values are taking us. Western culture has taken us where we are now, in this incredible, uh, tragic situation of violence and climate dissolution, um, I think there's I think there's something really important about the willingness um, to be vulnerable. You know, the willingness. Everything in our culture really is earmarked by security. You know, we build walls. We live in walls. Everything, if you look at it, is um, not just buffering us from the rest of nature, but each other. And everything is based on security, a security that is um, very fragile because it's, I think that's the, the, the impact of what the, the last X years on the pandemic and political mayhem and all that stuff. I think that's what's been so, is the reality is dissolved. It's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's a makeup world. And I think that's where the deep fear comes from. 
so to me, what the non-humans um, ask, you know, and are is be vulnerable. And I think that's the task is what does it really mean? You know, how much do we really need and how so concerned with our own comfort and our own security at the cost of everyone and everything else? Yeah, you know, this is where the, to me, the, the whole idea when you see, you know, these rabbits or the tortoises who have lost an arm or a leg, terrible trauma that they've gone through. And the absolute, we've talked about this, Dina, is the absolute, the full openness in most cases, in most every, every individual that I have met um, to start, to start again, you know, they're in the now. And they're willing to, to, to be in the now in an open and vulnerable place. And we are not in general. I'm just speaking in general terms that, that we withdraw. We withdraw so that our relationships fall into transaction as opposed to transformation. It may be the way, maybe, you know, um, uh, Whatever it is, for me, the question is, how do we open and immerse ourselves in that other way of being? Where do we have the courage? Where do we have the courage to um, overcome the culture's restriction? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at faces here. I know there are a lot of faces here of uh, people who have crossed those boundaries. And I don't know if they're particularly vulnerable. <laughs> I know that they, um, that, that their relationship with animals has crossed them, have, 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 have demanded that, um, that they step out of uh, the limitation. So uh, um, I'm looking at Raymond and I'm looking at Elke and uh, I, I know you're both giving your lives to, um, to that kind of understanding and wondering if there's something you wanna, uh, you wanna add or think about here or uh, can't help but see those elephants behind you, Elke. And when we uh, when we first met uh, so many years ago, uh, I learned that you were uh, giving massage uh, to to elephants, and um, you were an, an essential healer to. Um, to animals that were living so much out of their natural uh, ways and probably traumatized simply by that, if not more. Uh, and you brought that um, deep um, respect and caring and the kind of sensitivity I think that Gay is talking about, her understanding of the, this nonverbal understanding, which is what you um, offered. So, well, I'll just make a comment. I hope Elka does speak. That um, Elka speaking again on Friday, by the way, everyone um, is that in, that for many years she volunteered at the Oakland Zoo and was doing body work with the elephants there and other animals. Um, one story about the tortoises, which I particularly love, but in, in the most extreme way, she was not allowed to go inside with them. So they were behind bars. And so when you really appreciate it, maybe Elka, you can share that despite those very awkward, physical, threatening, um, obfuscating conditions that you were able by the evidence is the efficacy of your body work. You were able to create a space that um, broke through those structures. Yes, oh. I did. 
I did definitely uh, walk to the structures and was holding space, you know, I mean, holding space for the animals to express themselves and um, shows themselves in a different way that the people who care for them uh, maybe not be able to see because they're so uh, the 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 focus on husbandry is so strong that they are um, missing so many other signs. Yes, there there is observation, but it it's always in my mind uh, that there's something missing, and I've been trying to bring bring this across, but it has been a difficult journey, I must say. And and I uh, was sometimes discouraged, but nevertheless, the animal, the animal I'm working with uh, was taking my heart in and I could kind of try to put everything else around me uh, away which was not easy and it's still I'm you know going there all the time I just lost an elephant friend you know we just had Lisa euthanized on Sunday and I knew these elephants for almost 25 years I've been working with all of them so I had no idea that you couldn't go in the area with them. Oh yes, I I did work with them in a restraining out. The, you know there is something called a restraining shoot, where they get uh, husbandry, they get their feet clean, they get checked by the doctors. So I had direct body contact with them, not in the exhibit but behind the scene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So so okay. I it you was not free. your hands on them, not through bars. Uh, well, it it it's it's like a four by four or something like a structure, a steel structure, and so I had my hands could go there. All the place I had to be aware, but I could go all the places in the body. Most of it where I wanted to go, you know. So it was not a not a like a chain link kind of situation. It it was definitely body contact, all the way all around the elephant. And things where I could step up to to get reach the the back of the elephant. So. And I suspect that you, when you were working with someone who you knew for twenty five years, that you weren't working with an other. There's something about our language that the way we talk about the animals, yes. or the others, or the natural world. The language doesn't allow us to make the connect that is true. And so how do we how do we understand the connection that's not with others? doesn't have that distance in it that, it, that it really is an interconnection of, of beings equal to flowing through and with each other. And that's that, that's the the essence of the Tommy story and and why you're gonna bring that out into the world, Gay, okay, is because it works so hard to try to give language to this joint space of communication and understanding in which so much dissolves, including the facts of the body, even while we're taking care of this sick body so so carefully. I think we're just being called as a species to enter into, to dissolve the barriers and enter into that deep, deep space of, of, of connection. 
Um, Ray, how are you seeing things these days? Yeah. Hi, it's good to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, a little different uh, because as Gay knows, I lost a good friend two days ago who was, uh, I know it sounds corny to some people, but he was a 30 year old frog. And I had been taking care of him from, so he was a, put it this way, I got him in the divorce. And I've had him for 30 years since he was a little tadpole. And like you had been talking about, there was a change. And the gay talked about with Tommy, there was something happening over the last eh, four or five days where, you know, he would greet me every morning. I'd go over and hang out with him. And, you know, just in the last couple of months, he went back to an old behavior where he would come and climb in my hands when I would feed. You know, we'd sit and look at each other. You know, you can't like sit and watch TV together. You know, we got you know, hand me the channel turner. You know, you can't go with that with a frog. And then it was just on Saturday, I went to feed him and he wasn't there anymore. And he was at the bottom of his tank. And I can guarantee he was dead or close to it. So I took him out and uh, I don't know if anybody else has ever done this, but don't try CPR on a frog. And I, you know, I just massaged him and massaged him and he came back. He came back from wherever he was at because he had, is an underground frog. I don't know what the terminology are, you know, genius and species, but he lived 90% underwater and he would meditate all the time. He would just, I got pictures of him just hanging there and you know, he isn't there. He's somewhere else. And uh, I placed him back in the tank and put him on his driftwood and he was still in the same position on Sunday and that was it. But I think part of, where I learned, uh, and I don't know if anybody else had this experience, nobody ever told me that I couldn't get along with them and talk with the animals. You know, nobody said, no, do that, or you can't do that. And even when I worked with the Ellies, and uh, and I did hang out with four wolves at Pat Derby's ranch one time. And uh, if you don't act afraid, they're, then they're not afraid. They're, they're more afraid of us. Does that make sense? It's like, I wasn't afraid of them. You just go in your hang with them. You look at them. You look at their body language. You look how they move and how they talk to each other. And they'll let you know if you listen. If you choose not to, if you don't open up that the portals that wherever we have, not everybody does it. I think we all do. I think we learn to shut it off. You know, it's like, nah, you can't do that. Or you can't. Or, or when I grew up, to take care of animals was not considered that cool. You know, it was a different environment. You had to act tough and... You know, you didn't want to raise kittens and stuff. and uh, But my mom allowed me to do it, you know, just start hanging out with them. And uh, it worked. It's weird not having them around. It's the first time in my life that I haven't had an animal around me. Mm. That's different. Mm. You know, I, even this morning I get up and I'm looking at the aquarium and he's not there. You know, and my cat's gone. All my dogs that I've had, you know, everybody. But to have somebody in your life that was an animal for 30 years, that was pretty cool. And uh, it was a good experience. But uh, do I miss them? Yeah. I think what we have done, and Elke did it too, is uh, I think we went backwards. Especially, they're going to have captive animals probably forever, especially elephants, just to, like you said, because we can. But we went from going in with them and hanging out with them and you know, they would just, we'd make mud baths with them and rub up against them and clean them. And it wasn't technically massage, but it was a physical touch. And they loved it. And we've taken that away from them. And now all we do is exhibit them because we tell everybody that they're so mean. And enough people believe that. And I don't know why. Because this isn't the 1950s when they chained up Ziggy down in Chicago against the wall for years because he knocked down his keeper. So I don't know where the disconnect is. It's uh, some people blame COVID. You know, I used to ride the L going downtown Chicago all the time. And people used to talk to each other. Or at least they would give contact. They make eye contact. You know what I mean? Or someone would say, by the way, I'm a tourist. Can you show me where to go? Oh, Nobody, yeah. talks. Nobody talks to anybody anymore. They yeah. laugh at me when, I'm in, when I take the L. I take the Sun Times out and I read a paper. And people look at me like I'm some, you know, Cro-Magnum person because they all got their phones stuck to their noses. 
and I it just it's a weird feeling to not have it. That only happened over the last few years, and uh, and I'm sure you've seen it in your environment, Dina. I mean, that place was in the '60s was a mecca of music and love and touch and hanging out, and now it's how much do you want to spend for this house, or do you want to rent this? You know what I mean? It's just things have changed. I, I think we've lost that disconnect, and I hope we can get it back. I think the kids will do it. We'll have to give up our phones. Yeah, 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 probably, probably. Yeah, for, and say no to artificial intelligence. And if it's not, just, we will be destroyed. It's I, listen, I agree. Friends of ours used to own 200 acres on Palomar Mountain by the observatory. Uh -huh. and, uh, and it used to be fun going up there all the time because they had eight Labradors and I had a, a Siberian Husky who was probably half wolf. He was raised to be a sled dog and he would take off for two or three days. And we knew there was mountain lions up there, but we know, but nothing ever came of it. He'd come back and he goes, okay, everything's cool. And now they put casinos at the bottom of the mountain and everything is, I don't know what the term is. It's just, you're squeezing everybody back in, like Gay said, into walls and barriers. I guarantee it, even in my neighborhood, there's a lot of people don't even talk to their neighbors. They don't even know their neighbors' names, you know, as opposed to the olden days when you know, we had 41 kids under the age of 12 when I grew up in Chicago on our block. So Saturday morning, if you didn't get up and go to the park and play baseball, you were the weirdo because they would drag you out, you know? No, they would. You had to go. And we were, you know, we'd ice skate on the streets of Chicago. And we I always talk about it. And we joke about it. If we hit a puck off of somebody's car, and, you know, dented it, blew a window out, nobody cared. Now you're in court because you dented a Lexus or you, you know what I mean? That freedom is all gone, and I'm glad. I'm glad I grew up during that time. I really am. So. Well, I come from a Coney Island area, so I oh, know do you really? That. Okay, so you know exactly what you're talking about. And yeah, it was. Uh, it was fun, and the mothers actually did walk us to school. We actually walked a mile to school. Everyone says, "Oh, you, oh yeah, we did." Yeah, I did too, but I didn't walk with my mother. Well, they walked with us because they're all pregnant, so they had kids, so they walked with us. <laughs> yeah, because I we just walked to school. You know? Yeah, we just walked to school. We had a half an hour for lunch. We ran home, took two bites, and ran back again. But we had a community. I mean, everybody knew everybody. Everybody knew everybody's brothers. And, and we were still friends, even though we're all you know, dispersed around the country right now. But you know, I have bonds with some of the... I'm 68 this year. I have bonds with people that I've known for 67 years when we first moved to those old neighborhoods. And that's fun. You know, it, it is. And I miss it. And I miss it right now because everybody is afraid to talk to everybody else. And I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't. I'm sure you see it. You know, I don't know. What do you think? You think it's, you think it's an endless trip to go down and we're all going to go down one day? I think the only salvation is immersing ourselves in, in the intelligence and being of the natural world. It, it's my... Uh, one, <laughs> it's my one step answer to, you know, all, <laughs> all conditions, because there, there is nothing that I'm looking at that wouldn't be solved. Yeah, that's a good point. By that. And the, the, the essence of the natural world is that it is uh, interconnected. That's, you know, everything is connected with everything else. And everything is in conversation with everything else. And things are not isolated, you know. It's not like one species only stays with itself and has no connection with, with anything else. It's one interpenetrating dynamic, vital communities. And, and I think that's why we're having these conversations. You know, when, when I read um, the uh, description that we had written about two, com two um, uh, communities coming together, I realized, you know, my thinking of it, when we wrote it was it, it was too communities of humans who were meeting but really it's communities of humans meeting the communities of non-humans 
you know, trying to see together how we might cross those barriers that we've created and enter that world where we are so profoundly invited. I think that it's what everyone is saying. Um, your friend was friends with you. And Tommy or the tortoises or the other rabbits are friends with you. And I think one thing that I I lose track of and forget is um, because I'm sort of mission oriented. <laughs> No, I'm always writing something or doing something to make things right, right? And I guess that's one thing that I experience with the, the animals that always makes me feel good when I get out of my head is how much fun they have and how much joy they have and how happy they are just to be with you and alive. And in some ways, I always say to myself, stop being so serious, you know, <laughs> in that way, that there's a lot of humor and a lot of just plain joy. And I use the phrase faith in life. You know, when I was talking about the rescued animals and whatever, and, and you know, you know, the elephants that Ray has, has worked with and Elka, um, that, that for most cases, Elka, maybe you want to say a little bit more with these individuals, but um, how they just, they, you know, it's like girls want to have fun. They want to have fun. They want to be alive. They have faith in life, uh, except when it really gets literally beaten out of them. So I think, I think that is really, um, oh, that's a way of remembering who we are, even if we're human, is that there is this joy and acceptance and, and love of life, um, even when there's hardship as such. There's just like, you know, nonetheless, we're still alive. Nonetheless, you know, there's always the glass is always half full, not half empty. Yeah, that's actually true when you speak about joy. I mean, uh, my work with these elephants, they are, <clears throat> they are explained, they are, exp uh, they are expressed joy uh, playing with um, a, 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 a tire, for instance. We have one elephant she just loves that. She throws it around back and forth and runs and trumpets and it's, it's pure excitement. And then we have another one who loves to be in the water and splash like crazy. And that's an expression of joy, you know. So I really, these, I do see uh, captive held elephants are not just very, I mean, it depends where they are, but the Oakland Zoo is a place where I have definitely seen that over and over again. So I make distinctions between some of the facilities many activists uh, talk about, which are really not good. I'm not saying that a zoo, I'm not a zoo person that a zoo is good, but there are distinction of what happens at certain facilities. Okay. And, Can you tell the story? Uh, excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, but the story... It's way back for you, but with the young female tortoise, the Aldabra. Soila. Yeah. Soila. Yeah. Soila is an African spoor um, tortoise, and she was actually held in her own space. You know, she was not a good space inside, but outside, uh, she had a greenery and a, a nice place to room around and um which gave me some joy because I think that's very important that uh, they get out of their enclosure. But she, um, she was, a, and she still is an interesting creature because she is now with the Aldabra tortoises. And that's the biggest one, you know. And for a long time, there was hesitation to put her there, but it was a really good move. And she is um, a strong personality. Absolutely strong. I mean, she says, I want this and I doesn't I don't want that. And so it has been very um very healing for her to be with others, as you maybe remember, Gay, when we you wrote about that. Um and and um PTSD we mentioned with her, you know. 
Um, but I think that uh, time now where she is with the others in the much, much larger and closer, it's been a good thing. It's been, I think, healing for her. Well, with the wonderful part that you have so many things that you've probably forgotten, but it stuck with me is that um, she was a teenager. She was young. Yeah. Yeah. And you were asked, which was a big deal because you were sort of, people were skeptical of you. Yeah. But one of the zookeepers asked you to look at her. You've been with the elephants because she was constipated. Yes. And she was very sluggish. And yes. And that's why. <laughs> and anyways, can you just talk a little bit about that? Well, there was this issue uh, where she just, yeah, something was not right, you know. And and I think um, the body work was really good. First of all, it took a while, and it's still she's very, you know, she she wants something and and others doesn't. But she responded to me in that enclosure where she was quite well and what what also helped her um, to really follow her movements. Uh, she liked to be really wrapped on her shell and that's still their greatest joy uh, today or now. And so um, I think we, we broke through that constipation period, but I don't know exactly the, de the details. And now I don't know. Well, I, I'll, but I'm going to jump in because it was so wonderful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is that, you know, at the time she was in a very restricted enclosure. She didn't yeah. have contact with anyone else. Exactly. And it was so, I mean, it's, it's obvious, but it was remarkable because of the context is you began to do body work and, and massage her and touch her and things yeah. like that. And so then she did pass her poop. And yeah. um, and then we were recounting this to a colleague of mine who was is a psychiatrist and works with young women in particular. And she was so struck. She said um, it, in my in her work, she said, you know, a, a lot of the young girls she works with when they can't control their environment when it becomes too much then they control their body so they start to have these kinds of symptoms and so to me that she said it was just like the young women that she works with in the sense of that they, they they're cut off for whatever reason and certainly Soya was cut off from from you know she was a young woman wanting to be in the world right, right. engage right. fully and so to yeah. me that was just you know just the idea that you're connecting with her and touching her and uh I I know, just, a, just a beautiful her. thing and and Dina just kind of in response to say well how do we go there well that to me is a perfect example indeed <laughs> that's true and it's nice to see the change now which is really good to have her in a much better environment than she was back then when we talked about her. Yeah. So. You know, one of the things that feels important to me is, is to look at all of these beings as persons, you know, so there are the tortoise people and the elephant people and the rabbit or hare people. And that these are just persons that look different and have different systems, but there are some commonalities, and the commonality is that communication is possible, and it's up to us because they are communicating with us, it's up to us to um, to recognize it. Um, and because we're limited in our understanding of communication and our evaluation of it. Um, but if, if you think of them as persons, and they just look different than you, but they're not the only ones that look different than you. Um, and if we can get to really love difference, you know, to, to be excited by difference. And perhaps, as was said earlier, um, the great gift that 
these other persons give us is that sort of across the board, they have a sense of joy. That across the board, there is a um, deep, deep appreciation of life. Um, there's a, you know, if I, I don't mean to interrupt Dina, but it just, there's a concept that comes out of ecology and it's called landscape of fear. And it's been sort of the backbone of, of recent work in wildlife and, and environmental sciences. And one example uh, was illustrated in the Yellowstone. Everyone probably heard that in the news where they did a study where they were showing when the, um, when the wolves were quote unquote reintroduced, then the river revived, meaning a lot of the, the foliage came back and things like that because the, the ungulates were, you know, frightened, fear. And, and I've always, I, I think there's a little bit of logic in that, but I've always sort of bridled against the landscape of fear and, and you know, dividing the world into the predators and the, the prey and, and this obsession with fear because we are such as Charlie said, a fear determined culture instead of being fear informed. Um, and so I, I think when you were talking about difference, so I, like I said, I like to use the word diversity where there's basically we're the same with variations on the theme where, I mean, it's not that the forms are, the forms are certainly a, a kind of, uh, I won't say constraint, but they certainly order things. Um, I wrote about my rat Winky, you know, right, Winky, it could do things that I could never do, right? Because he was rat. Um, and the same thing with the tortoises and whatever. And same thing that I can do. Um, as my mother was always pointed out, you know, we have thumbs so we can open the fridge. And it was kind of a, you know, reminder that to pay attention to the non-humans because they can't open cans on their own. Um, so anyways, I think that this notion of fear is a huge thing that needs, that really it, it it reinforces difference in a in a in a way, and that there in the, the non-human world there is not this intrinsic fear as a foundation. As I said, I think there's a love substrate, which is you know an ineffable term for connection and being, and then fear kind of comes up and then it disappears. And Charlie used to talk about that a lot. Like I said, fear determined for fear informed. So that was just kind of a comment when you brought up this notion of difference and we're all just wearing different outfits. Well, I've, I've common substrate. The last years I've stopped listening to science because so much of the experiments and the interpretations are projections of, you know, so the whole fear thing is, is a projection. That's what they see. And so that's what they um, try to document. Um, the, uh, the film on uh, Yosemite uh, that's narrated by George Mombiat is a glorious film, and it's not about a landscape of fear, but it is about um, restoring right relationship and natural relationship between beings and going back to when the natural world that we have interfered with is restored, um, everything everything thrives and um and and the rivers come back and the trees come back and the um the general sense of of fertility um is is restored um and if you look at any landscape that human beings have not manipulated in some way, it is utterly gorgeous. You know, so I, I, I think I would like to offer that the other beings, the other peoples, offer us a joy and beauty and complexity and wisdom. And I'm throwing in my lot with them. That that's <laughs> that's what I've come to at, at this age. Uh, that that's where, in my view, good sense lies. And um, 
I think many of us have that secret desire, so uh, I encourage you to do the same. Reminds me of the poem by Joseph Bouchak. I've forgotten the name of it, but it's about the frogs. Uh, I think it's grandfather in the frog, something like that. Ray, speaking of frogs. And so uh, there's a grandfather and his son and they're driving and there's frogs all over the road and and the, the grandfather stops and, and picks them up and puts them off. And so the grandson is impatient. He goes, we've got places to go. And he says, well, they do too. And I think that that's also mm-hmm. that kind of recentering from our own agenda as being so important, implicitly important. Right, right. Yeah. And the place we have to go is to be with them. Uh, Step out of our limitations. You know, you you mentioned uh, intellectual barriers to some degree, this artificial intelligence and so on. Uh, You know, I look at uh, instinct, intuition, emotional, and rational terms of thinking. And uh, I think humans have lost the capability to lock into the in- instinctual. Mm-hmm. I think the instinct is, is, is a driving force behind life on the planet to, to a degree. I mean, it, it guides instinct in animals, guides daily life. And I think humans want to deny instinct. I may be wrong on this. But the more I look at it, the more I think they, they, they've they gone off. It's like we go on a parallel universe. Humans have gone off track, and they've gone to the, the rational, to the extreme. And uh, they've left instinct behind. And uh, instinct is a guidepost uh, for life. Uh, I remember when I was <laughs> younger, I... Uh, there was a, a a little girl that was uh, lost uh, in the, and it was cold. It was probably getting down to around forty degrees at night, and she got lost. And she was uh, probably just beyond the toddler, but you know, uh, we found her, and she was fine. She knew exactly where to go and what to do. <laughs> Uh, that was a real wake-up call for me at that age. I was just a kid, but I, I thought, you know, she she didn't uh, she didn't rationalize that. She knew where to go, and or she died, and uh, she got in a, a underneath a, a tree root and so on and and lived. But I think we we leave we've we've uh, we've become uh, separated from natural. The natural process, and like you were saying, if we don't get back on that, we're going to eliminate ourselves and everything else that lives on the earth if we don't watch it. Yeah. Uh, I may be way off on that, but I do believe that if we don't reconnect ourselves with natural process and get away from this artificial thinking, that we're going to kill ourselves. Well, I don't think you're way off at all. And you know, instinct is, is, is the primary wisdom, is it not? I believe so. Right? The primary wisdom that we come in with and that we forget and overlay and that all the other beings continue to live in that way. And it, it's... Uh, it's a relationship to the natural world, and it's not isolated. Rational knowledge can get very abstract and disconnected. Instinct is by they always instinct. talk about rational. They always talk about reason and rationality. And I always say, well, rational is rational be- until it becomes irrational. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and we've driven it when. When you read that poem this morning, Gay, on on that possum, mm. I, 
had that happen to me so many times. And I, I, uh, uh, I just call roads the ribbon of death for wildlife. They're just ribbons of death. They don't. There's no attempt to to regulate uh, uh, road uh, road construction in areas where there are vital crossings for wildlife, uh, ancient crossings for wildlife like deer and elk and and pronghorn. And that they know they migrate through there, and they don't, and they just build the road anyway. I, I, it makes it, it really angers me. I've talked to California Department of Transportation in California about it, and uh, I mean they they just put these roadways uh, right through the middle of a migratory pathway that is ancient. It's, they've done it for uh, hundreds of years, thousands. I don't know, but at least hundreds of years, and they use these to migrate in the fall and the spring, and and. Uh, uh, and they, there's no attempt uh, to circumvent those areas, and uh, so I, uh, that, uh, I've, I've had to work on a lot of animals that've been hit by cars. So I have a real thing with that. I don't, not sure everyone knows, but Mike is a has been a animal doctor, veterinarian for many, many years, working with various species as well as restoration work. Well, it just, it just, uh, that was a start. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you read that poem. I'd like to get that poem from you because I've always felt that way. I've, I've stopped and taken animals off the road and, uh, I've had people bring injured wildlife that have been hit by cars, bobcats, coyotes, uh, everything, birds. I, they, uh, I can't imagine the number of animals I've had to treat that were hit by cars. And it's just because people are, are just, they don't care. They just, they hit them and go on. And uh, somebody's good enough to stop and bring them in to me. But I, and I always commend them for that. But I'll tell you what, there's the, the cars, uh, the internal combustion engines, probably, as far as I'm concerned, is one of the worst inventions that ever, man ever found on. <laughs> you probably all disagree with that, but. No. Uh, I think many of us agree with everything you're saying. Absolutely agree with it. And also, um, you know, if you go online, uh, behaving like a Jew, Gerald Stern, S-T-E-R-N, it's online. And so... Um, I'll, I'll send a copy if anyone wants it as well, Mike. Too. I'd, I'd sure like to get it. That was a powerful, uh, that was a powerful poem. There's a individual in Oregon, I can't think of, Pretty well-known writer. I just can't think of it. He lives up on the Mackenzie River. Uh, I think he just died. I, I Gary know. Lopez. Gary ah, Lopez. He has a book written. Have you seen that book that he wrote on uh, animals that were uh, a tribute to animals that were uh, destroyed by in by cars and trucks? And yeah, stuff? it's an amazing essay uh, that he's traveling across country and he documents all the road kills that he came across. But anything you read by Barry Lopez will connect you with um, the natural world in the most um, incredible way. Yeah. Yeah, he was he was an amazing, uh, amazing person. Yeah. Yeah. This is a little bit, you know, in the other direction, but I, for some reason, this came up. Um, I had a Doberman named Fritzy, and I remember we were sitting next to each other, and, and there was some kind of meeting going on in our in our home with people from the government and whatever. And he was sitting next to me, and there was this one gentleman who was really obnoxious, <laughs> saying something kind of crazy. And Fritzy, that was my Doberman, looked over at me because we're he was sitting up there, and we looked over and exchanged exchanged glances I mean you could just read you know the balloon above his head and I, I guess the reason I'm saying that is because they um they, there's so much going on you know what I mean that that um I mean that was that I mean I, I had to stifle a laugh because you know he was kind of like oh my god you know and I I just think it's such a wonderful world to spend time in that is transformative I mean Mike you feel that way I know that your work is difficult, you know, with with ill animals, but there is this amazing, wonderful 
world, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, this morning I had to give a, a, a woman came over. I told her I'd give a shot to her dogs. Well, uh, my cat was outside and she knew this. I, I had her bring the dog in. And right away, the cat came up to the back door and wanted to come in and harass that little dog while I was trying to treat it. <laughs> Animals just have, a, they just know what they're doing. That's all there is to it. <laughs> yeah. Now, so, you you know, you got, you're right about, uh, uh, you know, we don't, Sometimes people bring animals into me and the animal looks like they know more about what's going on than the person that brought it in. I, I shouldn't say that, but I've had that happen a number of times. The animals know exactly what's going on. And, uh, and, and how do you tap into that? I mean, you know, you were talking about the rational versus the instinctual or the intuition. Do you bring those together in your work? Oh, absolutely. I, you know, I, I think... Uh, when I did a lot of work with uh, some of the migration routes on uh, uh, like uh, Sandhill Cranes uh, in Nebraska, uh, they'll, they'll, they're across about 650,000 cranes come through the, uh, that, <clears throat> that uh, bottleneck there put around Grand Island. And it's an amazing sight in the spring. Anybody who loves wildlife should go there. <laughs> Uh, you know, from about uh, the end of March or beginning of March till about <laughs> the beginning of April, because those cranes are on their way up to uh, Alaska and Siberia. And uh, uh, it's uh, but, you know, you talk about uh, uh, instinct. Uh, they know exactly. They know those roots exactly. And when those chicks are are born. Uh, they're ready to go on that route south, and they know exactly where to go. And uh, it's just like uh, monarch butterflies or any other migratory bird, anything on any of the flyways from the east to the west coast. Uh, those those birds are that there's something about nature. They know exactly where to go, when to go, how to go, and uh, uh, it's absolutely, and that's all, I guess we'd call that instinctual, but if humans would, were able to tap into that, I think that uh, we would improve our lives significantly. Because I, I always try to, you know, sometimes if you work around animals, you kind of start to want to think like animals. And uh, uh, humans, humans have, I think intuition is a very powerful uh, as is higher than than any rational or uh, a reason out uh, situation. If you know something's right, you know it's right. You don't have to reason about it. It's either it's either going to do the job for you or it isn't. But when you have to start rationalizing, you know you you better stick with your your uh, your intuitive your intuition and move. Well, I've seen that with medicine because. Uh, uh, when you know, a lot of times, uh, cancer patients, uh, animals and humans, uh, sometimes they're better at knowing what to do than some of these uh, modalities that will actually end up not so good. And, uh, you know, it's it's a very difficult situation to judge that, but I shouldn't be talking that way, but it's true sometimes. No, you know, I, I've just looked at two essays in in the New York Times. One was a, um, a a woman who had dreams that told her that she had cancer before the physicians recognized it, and another was a similar story about an intuitive understanding. And both of them start with this, well, this may be crazy, but, or, you know, I know it's not rational, which I also believe in this is in this requirement to genuflect before the temple of science and rationality, before you dare say what you know. And what I was struck with, with what you said, Mike, was um, 
you know, these beings know. They do. They yeah. know. And we think we know things, but we create a system that that is supposed to be what we know, and we deny um, and disconnect ourselves from deep knowledge. Um, and I wish we would stop apologizing for knowing things. Wish we would just know instinct, know, know through intuition, know through instinct, know through our dreams, know through what we learn from the animals, know through what we learn from winds or earth, trees. These are all persons that know in, in various ways. Um, well, this is where I think the notion of like even this gathering today is so important because it, it develops a human-human community, uh, which is reinforces and supports acting on that intuition and tapping into that intuition. Because in general, the what we're talking about, the instinct and intuition, is pushed back by the collective. It's antithetical. And so having a having community which is quote unquote interconnected to the instinct and instinctual and intuitive realm, which uh, animals and other beings live in, um, really, I think, is very helpful to making changes in our culture because it reinforces it's not isolated it's not like an isolating fact and charlie for example um it just came to mind when you were talking both of you you know people say oh you know he was criticized because he had to be right and he goes he used to say well what's wrong with being right <laughs> you know <laughs> if i'm not right um you know and, and i think he gave you know he gave many you know examples but if i'm if i'm not right about that ice on the lake then I can die because I'll fall through the ice and, and freeze to death. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's a difference in that, you know, the way he would talk about being right was, you know, not one, you know, upmanship or anything like that, but really talking about the congruency of doing things right in life. Yeah. Well, you know, something else that's interesting. I, I think most of the people on this call are women and Ray and I, I don't know. Is there any other male? Uh, any? Oh, yes. Okay. Wait. But I, I think uh, estrogen is uh, has a, a power uh, of of goodness that testosterone doesn't. And uh, <laughs> I think women relate uh, sometimes. I think ma matrilineal societies would be better than patrilineal societies, and I think. All of you on here agree with that. I mean, who goes to war? It's always the testosterone that goes to war, or it's always the testosterone that has to go out and prove themselves and kill everything. Or women aren't aren't. I don't see that uh, as much with uh, with uh, the estrogen drive than the than the testosterone drive. Now, now I'm really getting off into a deep lake, and I'll probably drown. <laughs> well. Maybe can I say I agree with all that? <laughs> I'm glad to hear you say that. Yeah, I agree with you, Mike, 100%. I'm not you know? sure that Wade agrees with that. <laughs> well, I always say all the time when I get in trouble, what what are the words that they say at, at the end of every prayer? They say amen. They don't say our women, do they? So we were it gets it goes in our brain, it goes in our cells. You know, we put us as the smartest. You know why? Because we wrote the book. <laughs> Have somebody else write another book, and you know what I mean. So it's when you write the book, you're not going to say you're not on par with all the other animals. Why admit that? We we go back. We're in charge. We have dominion over everything, and you're right. And I agree with Mike 100. percent And uh, and it's just the way it is. And a lot of people, a lot of my male friends, don't like that. But you know, I think I care. It's well, I think deal. it's testosterone in this culture. It's not testosterone per se. I think it's anger. Oh, that's that's the that's what it becomes, right? Yeah. In this culture, it's not that in 
um, the natural world. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna uh, I'm, I'm I'm gonna deviate a little and and go to what animals know. Cheryl, I'm gonna ask you to tell the story of the I believe it was the finch. The goldfinch. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it was the March equinox and I had gotten up to go to work and I <clears throat> really wanted to stay home because it was the equinox and I wanted to be with the equinox that day. But I got up and it was probably around six o'clock, 6.30 somewhere in that window. And I, I open the door and I go right out the door and I stand there to say my prayers. And I'm thinking about the equinox and how I could meet it for this day. Now it was just twilighty. I mean, it wasn't, the sun had not come out, but you could see things in the light. And, um, there's a yurt straight across from me, if anybody's been here on the land. And uh, I saw this, something flying towards me, but I could only see the shape. And it was only about three feet up off the ground. And as it got about five feet in front of me, it just fell to the ground. And I went to it and it was laying on its side, eyes closed, and it was a goldfinch. So I picked it up and I put it in my hands like this and I stood there and I realized that it was cold. So I just held it in my hand and I'd rub it on the top of its head with my thumb. And I'd say, come on, little fella, come on. And I'd start clicking, his beak was clicking and he clicked and he's clicking. Now I'm standing there and it's just getting a little bit lighter and I'm thinking, I've got to get ready to go to work. What am I going to do? I could go put it underneath the bush so it'd be safe. I could do this. I could do that. And then in that moment, in my heart, I said, no, I'm going to stay right here. No matter how long it takes, I'm going to stay here. And the bird, little flinch, finch keeps clicking, clicking, starting to get lighter. And I'm holding in my hands. And I'm rubbing them on the top of the head. Come on, little fellow. Come on, little fella. And then other finches are coming to the finch feeder and they're all on the finch feeder eating. And I open my hand just a little bit and I see that he's waking up and he's his eyes are opening. And I says, come on, little fella. And I open my hands and he stood there, <laughs> flew off to the bird feeder with his family. And in that moment, in that moment, such joy filled my heart. And when you're speaking of that joy, the greatest gift that little Finch gave me was that joy in that moment of knowing survival, the instincts, everything everybody is talking about. I felt it in my body just flood through that magical joy. And that was the greatest gift. Thank you, little Finch. And he knew, he knew to come to you. It did. It's astonishing. Yeah. I also have a Finch story. Another finch. <laughs> I found her in my backyard and she couldn't fly. She tried to fly, but she couldn't fly. And so I cleaned out a cat carrier and I had her for four or five days trying to figure out what to do. And I did have finch food and water. And I called wildlife images and a woman met me in Phoenix and um, and she would she would sit in this little basket while I was doing gardening for about four days. She lived with me, 
And finally, I met this woman in Phoenix, and she took her to Wildlife Images. And after two weeks, the veterinarian called me and said she had a serious eye infection. She couldn't see, and that's why she couldn't fly. And she was released with two other finches who had healed in Jacksonville. And I was so happy because she was healed and taken to Jacksonville with her friends and released in the forest. And I felt like I had done such a good deed. <laughs> right. Thanks for listening. <laughs> beautiful. Thank yeah. you, Nina. That's beautiful. <laughs> I've rescued lots of animals, and I've had cats neuters, and I have my grandson's little Klee-Kai husky here. <laughs> now, I'm going to be a great-grandmother in July. <laughs> Let's see. Of human people or non-human people? No, I'm going to be a great grandmother of a um, boy in July. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to say that I really uh, identify with so much what you said that humans have to get back to nature or we're not going to survive. And being a grandmother and a great grandmother, and I think about the future and I weep. The way the human species is handling everything on our planet. Um, young people are really suffering. Um, they don't see a future because the greedy are the greedy. And now the Will Project has been approved up in Alaska to dig, uh, dig for more oil. I mean, so much is greed. Greed and racism and the schools, my daughter who was just sitting here as a school counselor, what's happening in the schools, you all watch the news. It's very scary. Well, I really call on people to actively, dramatically, without any inhibition, live your values of, yes. your, you know, to just be completely out. Um, and not look at it as crazy or odd or extreme or anything. It It is, as Charlie would say, it's the right way. It's, be, it's the right way in the way you know it's the right way. It's because it supports life. It's, it's very simple um, standard. Does this support life? Does this support all life? Yeah. Does this action lead to a future for all beings? And if it does, then we live it. And um, and for those of us who are older, um, to to be there so that the younger ones will know that it is a viable way to live. You know, that they, they being have an example, being an example. Yeah, yeah. And they have they have they have a future if they support life, you know. Yeah. Thank you, Nina. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, everyone here. Thank you, Gay. <laughs> Dina, do you have a, a poem that you'd like to read for, oh. before we close? Would you close? Sure. Um, where is it? It was right here. Um, That's kind of a ridiculous question. Dina, do you have a poem? <laughs> well, this is not the poem I was going to read, but it's what I opened to. And um, so I, I'll read it. And it, it, it's relate, it relates. Um, leavings. I want what is left. The tea leaves. The soiled images on cards. 
The gasp of wounds as meaning slips away, the rinds of the alphabet that chewed poems of prisoners, the bones and the skeletons, the secretions, the shattered sperm, the spilled blood broken over the phlegm and the cough. It has always been women's work to prepare the corpse. But I will not make a corpse from these elements. I will make a child. I will make you such a rose of a child, a rose of a child held in the crook of the dark hand of a dead branch. I will make you a child shining like an angel from these elements of dark. And the child will sing. This is what we have. This is what we have to work with. So give them to me. First your dead moldering in the dreadful heat of your deserted cities. Then give me the iron birds in the sky with their demented warbling. Last I want your radiant soil with its eternal shimmer. Give me everything mangled and bruised. And I will make a light of it to make you weep. And we will have rain and begin again. Oh. Let's begin again. Thank you, Dina. Is that Nan? Nan, can you give us one line on Great Salt Lake? Can't hear you. <laughs> it's a hard assignment. I, I came on. I came on to beam gratitude for that poem, which is my favorite poem um, of yours, Dina. Thank you. And this whole conversation, amazing. Great Salt Lake is intelligent, sentient, fighting for her life, beckoning people to the shore who will help her, beckoning a winter that we've never had to help her. May she succeed. Thank you. You talk, you're talking about Salt Lake. Yeah. There's also salt and sea that needs attention, prayers, work. All, all sailing seas are in peril, this whole sisterhood of sailing seas. But yeah, we um, meditate every morning at 7 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. I maybe could share the link with someone who could share it. Anyone is welcome on behalf of imperiled water bodies, especially saline seas. And I actually wrote salt and sea on the altar this morning. Oh, know. yeah. Yeah. I used to water ski there. <laughs> yeah. And oceans. Mm -hmm. I used to scuba dive. What's mm -hmm. happening to our oceans? Yeah. Nan has spent... 49 days, second year in, um, in ritual vision um, at Great Salt Lake on behalf of her life. So welcome and thank you, Nan. This is an incredible conversation. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you. Oh, well, come again in June, right? Yes, our next meeting is on June 7th at the same time, and we'll be sure to promote and share the link and remind everybody as that approaches. Um, but we're very excited. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And Nan, if you would like to share that, um, the link that you spoke, I'll put my email in the chat and I'll make oh, sure please. everybody gets it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. All right, there it is. But thank you so much, everybody, for being here and sharing your time with us. This has been incredible, and we're so lucky to have you all here with us. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank have you. a great day. We'll see you on Friday for our conversation with Elka and again in June. And also, Mike is going to be speaking in May. Yes, Mike will be here to start off our next series on Earth Restoration. Mike will be, be chatting with us on May 5th. So more to look forward to before our next meeting of this particular series. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye, Dina. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.